Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers out there. What a wonderful day to be able to celebrate that. Uh, and what a wonderful day to be able to gather together and to worship this morning. I do just want to give you, um, just go over the announcements and prayer list uh, quickly uh, before we begin this morning. One, continue to remember uh, Sandell White. Um, Sandell Way in your uh, prayers. Uh, she is at Centennial Medical Center uh, in CCU room 27. Uh, so please can continue to remember Ms. Sandell uh, and continue to lift up all those who are listed on the prayer list. Uh, as far as the calendar goes, don't forget we'll have Bible class at 1050 following worship this morning. So I encourage you to stay for that. We'll have classes for all ages with an adult class uh, meeting here in the auditorium. And then Wednesday, we'll have our Wednesday evening fellowship meal at 530, and that is free, but you do need to sign up. So if, if you can see Leanne uh, to get signed up for that following uh, service this morning, uh, but I encourage you to come out and enjoy that time of fellowship and the meal Wednesday night, and then we'll have devotional and Bible class uh, following uh, that meal. And as far as with the adult class, one of the adult class is uh, Phil is teaching on Psalms 23. And just a reminder to all those who are, are participating in that class to continue to read Psalms 23 uh, each day and to watch uh, Matt Chandler's uh, Psalms 23 uh, video on Right Now Media. And even if you haven't been a part, didn't come last Wednesday um, and, and aren't planning on being in the class, I encourage you to, to participate in that as well, as that is a great passage for us to, uh, to read and to, to study. Then also for our youth, uh, just keep in mind for the calendar, uh, next Sunday night will be a devotional, so make plans for that next Sunday night. And then we have our Nashville uh, Inner City Ministry Catfish Dinner coming up May 20th and 21st. And if you're interested in, in joining in that, uh, please see Terry uh, to get signed up for that. And then also mark your calendars for May 23rd as that will be our grad night. That will be a come and go event from 3.30 to 5 as we're going to be honoring uh, Ethan as he is graduating this year. It's kind of, kind of crazy and surreal to think about uh, him being ready to graduate. But please come out and enjoy that time of, of being able to honor him. And we'll have a program starting at 4.15 uh, that evening. Also, just want to give you an update. This last week, uh, we were able to, to donate a lot of items for uh, East End uh, for their teachers for Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, and Rod was able to drop those off Monday morning. And, and I want to thank you for all the notes of encouragement uh, that you wrote to them. Uh, Rod said when he dropped them off that, that uh, Tori, who, who was taking in the notes, it, it almost brought her to tears. Uh, and so uh, I greatly thank you for your encouragement and in sharing in Christ's love and, and in honoring them uh, this past week. And then one final reminder, our Prayer Warrior Project, there is still is sign-up sheet at the back of the auditorium, but I continue to want you to, if you haven't signed up, uh, to, to get signed up for that. Uh, it's a great way for us to be able to lift up a congregation and this community in prayer uh, each day through the, through the rest of the year. And so it's something that that is uh, vitally important and, and is something that is very powerful. So I encourage you uh, to do that. This morning, I just want to read from the um, book, Jesus Calling. Uh, and today's reading, I thought, thought was uh, kind of fitting uh, with, with studying Jonah and just uh, with each of our lives. And so I'm going to read uh, from it. Don't be so hard on yourself. I can bring good even out of your mistakes. Your finite mind tends to look backward, longing to undo decisions you have come to regret. This is a waste of time and energy, leading only to frustration. Instead of floundering in the past, release your mistakes to me. Look to me and trust, anticipating that my infinite creativity can weave both good choices and bad into a lovely design. Because you are human, you will continue to make mistakes. Thinking that you should live an error-free life is symptomatic of pride. Your failures can be a source of blessing, humbling you and giving you empathy for other people and their weaknesses. Best of all, failure highlights your dependence on me. I am able to bring beauty out of your mistakes. Trust me and watch to see what I will do. Let us begin worship this morning in honoring our amazing God.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity on such a beautiful day to come together to, to be in your presence and to worship you. Father, please continue to, to watch over us every day. Um, please help us to, to see the opportunities that we have to share others with you, to, to bring others to you. Uh, Father, this, this uh, day we're also uh, honoring our mothers. We, uh, we thank you for, for their sacrifices, for their love for us. We are, are blessed to have mothers. Please continue uh, to, to help us to, to do your work each day. Please forgive us of our sins. Thank you for the, the gift of your son and his ultimate sacrifice for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you please stand as we praise God together? All oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. O holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing. Great are you. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. 
Taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. I once was blind. I could not see. Chains of sin had shackled me. But God in heaven heard my plea. Then Jesus, Jesus rescued me. Then Jesus, Jesus rescued me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. Now grace so sweet, it floods my soul, and hope eternal won't let go. My debt erased at Calvary, Jesus, Jesus rescued me, Jesus, Jesus rescued me. I will sing forever of your your love come down with my hands to heaven shout your praises loud I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out I will sing forever of your love come down well there's a home beyond the sky a song will sing for all of time the great Grave is empty, I am free. Jesus, Jesus rescued me. Jesus, Jesus rescued me. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. I will sing forever of your love. Come down with my hands to heaven. Shout your praises loud. I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out. I will sing forever of your love. Come down. I will sing forever of your love come down I will sing forever of your love come down please be seated today's scripture reading is Jonah 1 verses 3 through 16 and I can tell you already I'm not going to do as good of a job as the young ladies did last week but let's uh let's read it but Jonah got up to run away from the Lord by going to Tarshish Tarshish 
He went to the city of Joppa, where he found a ship that was going to the city of Tarshish. Jonah paid for the trip and went aboard, planning to go to Tarshish to run away from the Lord. But the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, which made the sea so stormy that the ship was in danger of breaking apart. The sail sailors were afraid, and each man cried to his own God. They began throwing the cargo from the ship into the sea to make the ship lighter. But Jonah had gone down far inside the ship to lie down, and he fell fast, fast asleep. The captain of the ship came and said, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe your God will pay attention to us and we won't die. Then the men said to each other, Let's throw lots to see who caused these troubles to happen to us. When they threw lots, the lot showed that the trouble had happened because of Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us, who caused our trouble? What is your job? Where do you come from? What is your country? Who are your people? Then Jonah said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The men were very afraid, and they asked Jonah, What terrible thing did you do? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had told them. Since the wind and the waves of the sea were becoming much stronger, they said to him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Jonah said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and then it'll calm down. I know it is my fault that this great storm has come on you. Instead, the men tried to row the ship back to the land, but they could not because the sea was becoming more stormy. So the men cried to the Lord, Lord, please don't let us die because of this man's life. Please don't think we are guilty of killing an innocent person. Lord, you have caused all this to happen. You wanted it this way. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea became calm. Then they began to fear the Lord very much. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made promises to him. Well, let me uh, continue to welcome and acknowledge all of our mothers who are here this morning uh, online as well as those who are here live. We uh, thank you so much and celebrate you on this Mother's Day. Uh, you have uh, provided some incredible help and wisdom and insight into all of our lives through the years, and we very much appreciate it. Uh, some of the advice that you have provided for us is fairly uh, stereotypical. Uh, so as an example, you know, always wear clean underwear in case you happen to get into an accident. Uh, you know, little gems like uh, another, for instance, uh, you know, if you were too sick to go to school, you're too sick to play outside, some of those types of things. Uh, one of the things that I did this week in kind of getting ready for the message, I, I did a little bit of work and, and, and read some things where individuals were talking about some more profound things that their mothers had said to them. Uh, one mom told her daughter, uh, who was rather despondent, she said, did you try your best? And uh, that's all that matters. And I thought that was a wonderful way of releasing some guilt and frustration that a person might have. Uh, another mom said to her daughter, never chase a boy or a bus. There will always be another. I, I thought that was, that was pretty profound. One that really caught my attention was from Manit Shahan. She is a celebrity chef. Uh, she's one of those folks that's on the Food Network. Uh, she just last week won the second season of the uh, Champions. So she's, uh, she's absolutely an incredible chef. Uh, she has a Nashville connection. She has four restaurants here in Nashville that she operates and started. Uh, one of those is uh, Rachel and I's in our top kind of five or so. Uh, but uh, Ms. Chowan said that she grew up in India, and being a girl was a very big disadvantage there. 
Her mother gave her a lifetime advice, but the most important thing she said was that being a girl or being a woman was my biggest strength, was my biggest strength, and that really moved and motivated her. Uh, of course, the truth is that the message of our moms can get a little bit old, can start to fall on deaf ears. Uh, you, you know, many mothers, I, I know we're, we're protectors, okay? Uh, but, but they say almost ritually, be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Well, be careful of what? Be, you know, how, how am I supposed to act or respond to that, okay? So it, it's such a vague and overused phrase that it almost, uh, well, we become immune to it. Well, today as we get into Jonah chapter 1, we're, we're going to talk about Jonah not hearing what God is trying to say. Uh, Jonah is just not following along from the instructions that he's receiving, not from his mother, but from God. And, and the story does this in a very wonderful way by picturing a contrast between Jonah and almost everything and everyone else who seems to hear from God. And so uh, we're going to try to discover that message in the first part of the message and then apply it in a very challenging way in the second part. Now, last week, we had the kids come up here and give us an explanation of the book of Jonah. And they did a great job. Greg has already alluded to that. Uh, we can't have them up here every week. Well, maybe I guess we could. It would, it would be cute. But, uh, it, you, you know, anyway, so I've got another overview for you of the book of Jonah. And this one is going to be a sketch by a guy by the name of Tim Mackey. And I'm just going to warn you, it's an overview of all four chapters and some of the major themes, and it's about eight minutes long, okay? So uh, get ready to settle in. Let's go ahead and, uh, and get that started. The Book of Jonah, a subversive story about a rebellious prophet who hates God for loving his enemies. Jonah's unique among the prophets of the Old Testament because they're typically collections of God's words spoken through the prophet. But this book doesn't actually focus on the words of the prophet, rather it's a story about a prophet, a really mean and nasty prophet. The book of Jonah has a beautiful design with all this literary pairing and symmetry. So you have chapters 1 and 3 telling the story of Jonah's encounter with non-Israelites, first with some sailors and then with Jonah's hated enemies, the Ninevites. And each part offers a comic contrast between Jonah's selfishness and the pagan's humility and repentance. Chapters 2 and 4 contain prayers of Jonah. One is a prayer of repentance, kind of, and the other is a prayer in which Jonah chews out God for being too nice. Now, this careful design of the book is matched by a really unique style of narration. The story is full of all of these stereotyped characters who, ironically, do the exact opposite of what you think they would do. So you have the prophet, the man of God, who rebels and hates his own God. You have the sailors who are supposed to be really immoral, but actually they have soft, repentant hearts and turn to God in humility. You have the king of the most powerful, murderous empire on the planet, and he humbles himself before God because of Jonah's five-word sermon, and even the king's cows repent. This kind of story fits what today we would call satire. These are stories about well-known figures who are placed in extreme circumstances, and they use humor and irony to critique their stupidity and character flaws. Let's just dive in and we'll see how all the pieces work together. The story opens as God addresses Jonah and commissions him to go preach against the evil and injustice in Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, Israel's bitter enemy. But instead of going east to Nineveh, Jonah goes in the opposite direction, finding a ship going as far west as you can go to Tarshish. Now the big question here is why? Why does Jonah run? Is he afraid? Does he just not like Ninevites? And we're not told yet. So the man of God tries to run from God, and he boards a ship full of pagan sailors. He goes down into the ship, and then he falls asleep. So God sends a huge storm to wake up his prophet, while ironically the sailors above board are wide awake to everything that's happening. They can discern that there's a divine power at work here. So they throw the dice, and they discover that Jonah, he is the culprit. 
So they ask Jonah to explain himself, and Jonah spouts off a whole bunch of religious mumbo-jumbo. He says, yeah, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God who made the sea and the dry land. What a joke, right? God made the sea and the dry land all right, and Jonah's dumb enough to run from this God by getting on a boat? And when the sailors ask Jonah what they should do, he says, kill me, right, by throwing me overboard, which kind of seems noble at first until you realize this could actually be his most selfish move yet. I mean, what better way to avoid going to Nineveh? So he puts his blood on these innocent sailors' hands by trying to force them to kill him. They're reluctant, of course, and they repent to God even as they toss him over. The storm subsides, and they end up fearing the God of Israel, and unlike Jonah, they actually worship God. But God foils Jonah's plans to escape Nineveh. As Jonah's sinking, God provides this strange, watery tomb for him, the stomach of a large fish. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, this would be certain death. But in this story, everything's upside down. And so Jonah's submarine death becomes his passage back to life. Cramped in the stomach of this beast, Jonah utters a prayer, where he never technically says that he's sorry, but he does thank God for not abandoning him, and he promises that he will obey God from this point on, no matter what. And God's response is quite comic. The whale vomits Jonah back onto dry land. So once again, God commissions Jonah to go and preach in Nineveh, and Jonah complies. We're told that Nineveh was a gigantic city. It would take days to walk through. So Jonah gets one day in, and here is his message. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. It's five words in Hebrew. Now, his sermon is very short, and it's also odd. I mean, look at what's missing. There's no mention of what the Ninevites have done wrong, or of what they should do to respond. There's no mention of who might overturn them. And most noticeable, there's no mention of God. What's going on here? Has Jonah intentionally given the bare minimum of information? It's like he's trying to sabotage his own message or ensure the Ninevites' destruction. There's just no effort on Jonah's part here. Whatever his motives are, the plan doesn't work. Because no sooner does he utter this five-word sermon that the king of Nineveh, the entire city, including all its cows, repent in sorrow and ashes. So for the second time, these evil pagans show themselves to be more responsive than God's own prophet. So God forgives the Ninevites, and he doesn't bring destruction on the city. Now, here's the brilliant part of the story. The last word of Jonah's short sermon, overturned, means just that, turned over. And it can refer to a city being overthrown or destroyed, like Sodom and Gomorrah, but it can also be used of something being transformed, like turned over and changed into its opposite. And so, comically, Jonah's words actually came true, but not in the way that he intended. Nineveh does get turned over as Jonah's enemies repent and find God's mercy. The final chapter brings all the pieces together. Jonah, he's fuming mad, and he utters his second prayer. He first tells God why he ran away back in chapter 1. It was not because he was afraid. Rather, it was because he knew that God was so merciful. And this is great. Jonah actually quotes God's own description of himself from the book of Exodus, and he throws it back in God's face as an insult. He says he knew that God is compassionate and that you would find some way to forgive these horrible Ninevites. You can just hear the disgust in Jonah's voice. Jonah then cuts off the conversation, and he prays that God would kill him on the spot. He'd rather die than live with the God who forgives his enemies. Fortunate for Jonah, God doesn't comply and simply asks if Jonah's anger is even justified. Jonah ignores the question and he goes outside the city to camp on a nearby hill, waiting to see what might happen. You know, the Ninevites might repent of their repentance and get roasted after all. What happens next is very odd. God provides this viney plant to shade Jonah from the sun, and that makes him quite happy. But then God sends a tiny worm to eat up the plant, and so Jonah loses his shade. And there, in the heat of the sun, Jonah asks again that God kill him. So God, again, asks Jonah if his anger is justified, and Jonah barks back, absolutely just let me die. And those are Jonah's last words in the story. God's final words are what concludes the book. He says that this whole vine incident was an attempt to get through to Jonah, right? Jonah got all concerned and emotional over this vine, which he only enjoyed for a day. And God asked Jonah, you know, aren't 
humans a bit more valuable than vines? I mean, isn't it okay if God might feel the same kind of emotion and concern for the city of Nineveh that's full of thousands of people who have lost their way and also their cows? And that's how the book ends, with God asking Jonah for permission to show mercy to his enemies. And what is Jonah's answer? The story doesn't say, because that's not the point. The point is that the book is trying to mess with you. And God's questions here are actually addressed to you, the reader. Are you okay with the fact that God loves your enemy? And so this book holds a mirror up to the one who reads it. In Jonah, we see the worst parts of our own character magnified, which should generate humility and gratitude that God would love his enemies and put up with the Jonah in all of us. And so this strange story actually becomes a message of good news about the wideness of God's mercy that ought to challenge us to the core. And that's the book of Jonah. So the sketch reminds us that Jonah is a singular book. This is not like other books that we read in the Old Testament, New Testament. It's not a book of prophecy. It is, uh, it's not going to give us the words of God to somebody. It is focused on telling us the story about the prophet. And that is a, a key difference that we see here. Uh, further, it, it reminds us that this is a story that is written in extremes. And it breaks down some stereotypes. And so the good guys are actually the bad guys, and the bad guys end up being the good guys as we read through it. Uh, and so, to again, just kind of remind you, uh, God has come to his prophet Jonah and has, he, he wants him to give a message, and Jonah rejects that. And instead of going to Nineveh, he goes down to Joppa and gets on a boat to head to Tarshish. Uh, we have, uh, we've said that's the opposite direction. Here's a map for you. Uh, Nineveh was, uh, you know, about 500 some odd miles or so away from Joppa. Uh, Tarshish, 2,500 miles the opposite way, opposite direction. And so he is headed the opposite way. It's an extreme. And the rest of chapter 1 is, is really the initial experiences that happen as, as Jonah tries to run from God. So, so Jonah gets up, goes down uh, uh, to Joppa, he pays his fare, he boards his ship, and he goes down below deck, and the text says that he falls into a deep sleep. Now that sleep is not just literal, it is figurative, because he kind of checks out. Now while he's asleep, uh, there are a huge lot of events that occur in the next four verses or so. Uh, the ship, the crew gets it out into the water. They get some piece away from the shore. And then there is a huge storm that comes up. I'll remind you that word huge is used 15 times in this book. And, uh, and that's, what, that's the way this storm is described. It is a huge storm that, that comes up. And these pagan sailors fear that they're going to lose the ship. And so... Uh, uh, they, they're afraid that it's going to break up. In, in fact, there's kind of a, a funny little point in the original Hebrew where the ship is personified. The ship threatened to break up, if you're reading in the NIV, kind of trying to capture that. It's like the ship has a mind and it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall apart, okay, in this storm. And so the response to this fear is that these pagan sailors respond with prayer to God. Now, all of this mess is because of Jonah, right? All of the problem that these sailors and other folks are having is because Jonah has not done what God wanted him to do, okay? Now, they don't know that yet. But this is Yahweh, the personal name of God, the, the Lord, who is after Jonah, who's down sleeping below deck. God's mission is to seek and to save the lost. That's not just in the New Testament. That's also true in the Old Testament. And, and his aim is for Jonah to take that message to Nineveh. And Jonah has rejected that task, but God will not turn loose of his plan. He will not change. He's not going to let 
is love and mercy toward the Assyrians be thwarted by a disobedient prophet. And so his fierce love moves him to pursue Jonah, who's again asleep, still asleep downstairs. Now, now back to the story, the sailors are asleep. Uh, they are, they're about to come apart at the seams. Their boat is about to come apart. They're yelling, probably to be heard over the sound of the storm that is raging. And, and they're alert. They've been in storms. These are not rookies. These are folks that have seen some of the terrors of being out on the Mediterranean. They know that this one is extreme. And, and they know instinctively that somehow these are divine powers that are at work. And so these polytheistic pagans, that means they believe in many, many, many gods, hundreds, maybe even thousands of gods, these guys begin to pray to all these different deities, all right? So they're becoming more desperate. They're becoming more religious. And Jonah, again, what's he doing? Jonah's asleep. Okay, he's, he's asleep. He's, he's completely uh, out of it at this point. And, and that's a contrast that is just shocking when you read through this book. And, and again, the whole story is kind of an exaggeration. So we get to verse 6, and the captain now goes down to him and, and says, How can you sleep? Get up, call on your God. I mean, maybe your God will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Now, I, I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not. Again, you've heard this story a thousand times, but, but that is such a loaded statement, okay? D did you pick up on it that time? He wants Jonah to pray so that his God will notice them. What's their problem? Their God notices Jonah. Their God already notices them, right? These pagan, polythe this polytheistic captain who doesn't really know Yahweh, he doesn't know the Lord, okay? He reminds Jonah, who's supposed to be a prophet, regularly in contact with God, that he needs to be praying. So now they've got a, another step that they're going to try to do. They cast lots to see if they can determine who it is that is responsible for this calamity. In our day, we would say that they draw straws, okay? They cast lots, we tend to draw straws. And of course, when they do that, their process falls on Jonah. And, and that leads them to a whole series of questions. And Jonah, as he begins to answer, does so. And as I'm reading this story, the irony just explodes, okay? Uh, he says, first of all, I am a Hebrew. And then he adds that he is a worshiper of Yahweh and does this little bit of bragging. He says, you know, remember, they're only pagans. They don't know. He's the one and only God. He's the maker of everything, the land and the, the sea, okay? And, and, and at that point, we're kind of like, you know, does he really worship the Lord? Does he really, in, in the words of some translations, fear God? No. I mean, that's the reason he's on the run, right? Because he's trying to get away from God. Now, these pagans, they may, be, uh, they may be pagans, but they immediately see the contradiction. And so in verse 10, they get afraid, and they start to ask Jonah what he has done. And in the story, the way it's kind of sketched, there's an aside that takes us back to when Jonah first got on the ship or on this, this boat. Obviously, there had been a little bit of small talk, you know. Some guy comes on that you don't know, and he says, hey, I, I want to pay the fare, and I want to go to Tarshish. And so you can kind of imagine, you know, a little bit of small talk there at the dock, and one of the guys asking him, well, business or pleasure? And so the guy answers, or Jonah answers, uh, well, really neither. I'm running away from my God, Yahweh. And, and so this guy's, again, polytheistic. He, he doesn't really know any of these other gods. He doesn't recognize that name. And so we might say something like, well, never heard of that one. Welcome aboard. No one here will turn you in. Ha, ha, ha. And, and they kind of go on, okay? But now those words have great meaning. And so returning to the text, 
You told us you were running from your God. Yahweh is the God who has power over the sea, and you're running from him on our boat. And they now realize what they are up against. And they, uh, it, it's verse 11, and the storm, which was huge, is now huge-er, okay? It gets even stronger. And, and so they asked Jonah what they, could, what they should do. And Jonah says, you ought to throw me overboard. And, and there's two ways that we can read that. One is, and you'll see some of the commentaries that mention that, uh, and, and that is that Jonah at this point has had a, a change of heart, that, that he's had this self-revelation, and, and he now realizes that his actions are kind of cause the destruction of these innocent folks. And so he says, well, you just throw me overboard and you guys will be better. It's better for one to die than for everybody else to. And, and that's possible. I, I don't really uh, agree with that, but it's at least possible. Number two, and I really think in my mind this is the correct one, this is the ultimate act of defiance from Jonah. Okay, in other words, he says, God, do you think you can scare me into preaching to the Assyrians? I will show you, I'm going to settle it once for all, I'm going to drown myself, and then you'll have to find somebody else to do your preaching for you. And, and I say that because it fits in perfectly with what we have over in Jonah chapter 4, where a couple of times he asked God to kill him. And so, and so whatever Jonah has in mind, the sailors think this is a terrible, horrible idea. And, and so the first thing they do is to try to row back to land, okay? And they can't because the sea, again which was huge and then huger, has now got hugest, okay? And, and, and so this is really wild. And, and so now these sailors begin to cry out to God. And, and there is an incredible difference between these early statements of the sailors crying out to God, little g, and what's happening here. Because they're not just crying out to any God now, they are crying out to Jonah's God. They are crying out to Yahweh. They are crying out to the Lord. And, and they, are, they are asking him for forgiveness. Okay? And, and, and when, the first, when the storm first hit, that wasn't where they are. But they've been moved along because they've responded to this. And this experience has taught them that there's only, yeah, as Jonah said, one God over the sea and over the land, and, and he is the most powerful God. Their hearts had been changed by this story. And so they ask forgiveness for what they must do, and then they take Jonah and they throw him overboard. And, and as a confirmation of their actions, uh, that's when this storm immediately begins to calm. And, and when that happens, the sailors what? they, in verse 16, greatly fear the Lord. Now, now I just kind of remind you, uh, if you go back and, and you look at that initial statement from Jonah, he said that he feared the Lord. He worshiped the Lord, right? But by his actions, all the way through this first chapter, he's not done that. So who is it that actually ends up fearing God? It's the pagan sailors. They're the ones who have this. And so, like I said, the bad guys turn into the good guys. The good guys show up as the bad guys. In fact, these sailors even end up making a sacrifice and making vows to the Lord. Now, I'm going to stop right there because, well, everybody knows what happens next. And we'll get into that next week as we look at chapter 2. Uh, but I do want to make just a couple of two or three quick points of application as we step away here from the book of Jonah. Uh, the, the first is that God is active in our world even when we don't recognize or see it. A, a, a couple of years ago, we had uh, Wes Bender who was in and Wes did some congregational study work for us and and it was, uh, it was great to meet and to hear him speak. He did a summer series uh, with us as well. Wes had a, a, a statement, a line, uh, an observation that he, he used many times in his conversations. 
And that is that God is already working in our world. And we don't have to pray for God to move. God already is moving. And, and our task really is to listen and to look and to find what God is doing and join God in, in doing that. And I want you to observe that Jonah is 100% the opposite of that. In Jonah chapter 1, there are a boatload of pagan sailors who are converted. And they start the chapter calling on any and all gods. They end the chapter embracing the Lord and even making vows to him. But Jonah, Jonah spends most of this time asleep, if not literally, figuratively, totally out of it in terms of what God is doing. And I'm really afraid that many Christians today are much like Jonah. God is active in our world, but too many of us are in our own little bubble asleep to what God is, is doing around us. You know, because of what happened to George Floyd, things have been happening in our nation about race and race relations in massive ways. And I am convinced that God is using those things. But how has that really affected or influenced or changed what we do or how we address circumstances? How have we as individuals, as a congregation, become more involved? We say, oh, well, what happened to Mr. Floyd was such a shame. And, and absolutely, it's it much worse than that. But what have we really done in response to that? I mean, there are transformational acts and things happening in our culture, in our society. But many of us, quite frankly, have been sleeping through the movement of God. COVID has been a hugely dramatic phenomenon that has impacted almost everything in our world. Our, our, our families, our travel, the world economy, education. And, and we won't know the full permanent uh, influence and impact of that probably for years to come. Indeed, I think, however, 5, 10, even 20 years from now, people are still going to be talking and writing books about what happened and what the influence and impact was of the pandemic. But I want you to understand, God was not surprised by COVID. God wasn't taken aback by what happened. Instead, God was and is working in our world through it. But again, I ask the question, what have we done to meet God there? I, I'm afraid many of us have been asleep, imagining that we're going to wake up in June or July, and it's going to be just like it was in February of 2020. And it's not going to be that way, folks. Things are going to be different. So how are we engaging? Jonah is surrounded by people who are alert and who are active to the actions of God. They are changed. He is not. Now that connects to a second item that I observe here. One of the great tragedies here in Jonah chapter 1 is that his rebellion against God makes him apathetic and blind to his sin and the impact that his sin is having on those who are around him. You know, the sailors, when they throw that cargo overboard, they lose their profit. The individual who hired them to carry that cargo, he may very well lose everything. The ship has probably had extensive damage from this particular uh, storm, and as a result, it may have to have repairs. But Jonah, he doesn't see any of that. He's only thinking about Jonah. And I'm convinced that that happens whenever Christians sin. You may have heard this past week that Josh Duggar was arrested for possession of child pornography. That is an unbelievably selfish, horrible 
crime that feeds only that pleasure. Uh, but that sin that he committed has both direct as well as indirect consequences. And so most likely he's lost the ability to be around his six, uh, soon to be seven children. He's not going to be able to live with them anymore. I, I don't know who would employ this young man uh, uh, going forward uh, with that kind of a track record. He calls himself a Christian and his actions are just an embarrassment to any of us who share that title with him. His participation in these horrible acts, these awful practices, support and encourage others to even manufacture more of this stuff. And, and you, might, you might think anybody who would, who would do that, well, they would, of course, think about that impact, right? And the answer is no. That's the nature of sin. It blinds us to any of the possible actions that might happen or result from it. Almost every morning when I cut on the news, there's a story about a murder or carjacking or shooting or robbery that occurs. And oftentimes the offender or offenders are someone in their 20s or teens. Some are even younger than that. You probably heard this last week. A sixth grader, a, a girl who was 11, 12 years of age, took a gun to school and shot a couple of people. And, and, and those events, whether in, in that event there in Idaho in that school or, or even in our local community, I, I mean, it's going to change those individuals' lives forever. But did they sit down and weigh that out before they did that? No, not at all. That is the nature of sin. It is selfish. The spouse who cheats, they're not thinking about how that might impact their husband or wife or children. A, a drunk driver, they're not thinking about who might be in the car that they, uh, that they have an accident with and who might be killed. I mean, the statement was, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but that's, that's wrong. That's not the way sin works, folks. And reversing this failed thinking is crucial to our facing and overcoming our sin. Now, the third item that I see here in Jonah chapter 1 is that Jonah manifests a spiritual contradiction. When the lot falls to him, Jonah offers a quick but rather useless explanation that just drips with hollow arrogance. First of all, he says, I am a Hebrew. Then I can imagine him saying that very proudly with almost the unspoken word, and you are not. And I serve the great God who made the heavens and the earth, and you're pagans, and God doesn't care about you. Uh, but those are just Jonah's words, okay? Uh, the reality is that God is concerned about those sailors and respond to them. American Christianity in general, and I would submit churches of Christ in particular, have fostered this similar situation. We rather clearly say that we are saved by grace, and indeed we are. But that often comes like a get-out-of-jail-free card that we can use to do almost anything. And so Friday and Saturday night, we'll, we'll you know, let it rip, and then on Sunday, we come to church and everything's good. And that is a warped perception that is even entered into our, our whole culture where, where we've got these Christians, supposedly, who are experts in stating their theology, but not in living it. These actions are deep contradictions, and too often, for me, my response is, I tell you what, I sure wouldn't do something like that. But do you realize that when we say that about Jonah or our culture, we just did? Because the moment that I start to feel superior, I put myself in on the same boat as Jonah. I fall into the same trap. 
I drive the same way to my office each morning when I leave the house. Same road, over and over again, same branch, been doing it now for almost eight years. And sometimes as I'm doing that, I get about halfway to my office where the red lights kind of start, and I realize that I am totally unaware of what I've been driving for the last five minutes. Our word for that is asleep at the wheel. Now, I wasn't, you know, physically sleeping, uh, but, but I just wasn't aware of what was happening around me. And I think that's what we see in a very real way with Jonah here. He's spiritually asleep. He does not see his sin. He doesn't see the impact of his rebellion against God on those who are around him. He doesn't see that his statements of faith are contradicted by his rejection of God's instruction. And tragically, a similar thing can happen in our lives. And these are, I'm convinced, key points for us to consider this morning as we prepare our minds to gather around the Lord's table. Paul says that in communion, one of the purposes of that ought to be to examine ourselves. And Jonah, I think, this morning provides a great framework for us to reflect and consider as we begin prepping for and preparing for that time around the Lord's table. Bill? Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, he is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. We gather here in Jesus' name.
His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is head. Though unseen, he meets us here. In the breaking of the bread, we'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. Well, I had the opportunity on uh, Friday to participate in our Prayer Warrior Project, and uh, I, I tell you, if uh, you haven't signed up for that yet, please do. It, it's such a, a great opportunity, a privilege, an advantage that we have as Christians to uh, partake in, in something like that where we can pray for one another, uplift one another, be uh, uh, watching out for one another in our thoughts and, and uh, just taking all of that to the Lord. So like I said, I had a, an opportunity to do that Friday and I went ahead and signed up for each Friday in May. So uh, this last Friday, it was 39 minutes because you're... Uh, kind of called to, to pray your age, so to speak, or at least that's a, a decent guideline for you. Uh, next Friday, I'll pray for 39 minutes. And then the next Friday and the Friday after that, I'll be praying for 40 minutes, if that tells you anything. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to the added prayer time. I don't know about the connotation as to why I get that extra prayer time, but uh, definitely looking forward to that. And uh, I, I don't know the exact time that I prayed on Friday, but I know it was a, a hair more than 39 minutes. Um, so I, in my thoughts this morning, I, I thought about that that activity or, or what we were trying to do and, and that opportunity that we're given and relate it to this opportunity that we're going to have this morning. I also thought about meals because I, I, I chose to fast and I realized I'm kind of breaking Matthew 6, 18 and what we're called to do to not really make a big deal about that. But I say that because um, I was hungry on Friday like I am every day. And then one of my coworkers decided, hey, Ben, let's go get some donuts for the office. Now, nah, let me sit that one out. Uh, a lot of times we'll have meals together. We'll, we'll, I'll go pick up lunch for everybody or, um, you know, collect some money and go pick up lunch for a few of us and, and we'll eat together. No, let me sit that one out. Uh, one of our ladies from our teller line uh, uh, came uh, mid-morning Friday and said, hey, Ben, we've got new candy back here if you want some. No, I'm good. Let me sit that out. So uh, definitely a challenge there, but once again, a meal that we get to, to share together this morning. But to the prayer part of that, um, I, I took advantage of some time to pray on the way to work. Uh, no, I didn't fall asleep at the wheel. I was locked in. Um, 
I, I took advantage of some time to pray uh, during some lulls in my day. Um, at lunchtime, instead of sitting there eating, I actually went for a prayer walk. Uh, we've got a park right down the street that's great. I mean, it's, it's well kept. It's very pretty. A lot of people out walking. Um, got to, you know, just smile and, and say hi to different people and, and pray for them as I pass by. I prayed for you guys. I prayed for my family. I, I, I prayed for a lot of things that were going on, um, a, a lot of moving parts at work that day. So I, I was praying for those situations. And what amazed me is how the phone calls started pouring in, phone calls that had been waiting on all day, all week, really, for a couple of things that we needed to, to make happen, not because I'm, I'm trying to accomplish something necessarily, but what it means for, for those people that are involved. Uh, so very thankful for that. And, and uh, I, I got a chance to just see the, the fruits of not our labor, but the fruits of what we do through that prayer. And uh, so it all kind of culminates together. And as I was tying together my thoughts for this morning, I thought about the opportunity that we have to take a meal together that drives us right back towards prayer. So let's do that now. And then let's take this communion together as we celebrate, commemorate, think about um, uh, our, our Lord Jesus who sacrificed himself just for our benefit as we take his body and take this symbolic uh, uh, piece of his blood. Let's pray. Father God, you've blessed us so richly. You give us these opportunities. You feed us. You take care of us. And you give an avenue for us to come to you in prayer. And I pray that we take that seriously, that we celebrate that, that we use that, that you use it to mold us as we come nearer to you, as we draw nearer to you, as we celebrate and commemorate this opportunity that you've given us through Jesus Christ, your son, where he sacrificed his body, body and he gave his blood that we might be washed, that we might be sanctified, that we can appear before you holy and blameless because of his awesome love for us and what he sacrificed for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You know, I think it's important for us to learn uh, more about each other each and every day. As, as someone comes up here, I think you're going to see more and more informal, and, and, and a little bit more informal. I appreciate testimony from Ben. And as we learn to, you know, as we become better together and learn more about each other, uh, I would ask you guys to challenge each other to, to really, um, not necessarily challenge each other, but at least convey your thoughts. Be less guarded. You know, here at this family, we are one body. And uh, as we fellowship together um, and commune together and all those type things, uh, just open yourself up to this body so we can become stronger together. Uh, a couple of announcements here uh, as we close. Um, close out in prayer in just a minute. The teachers on the back of your, your uh, the bulletin, uh, we've asked our teachers to bring down the children after the end of class. Uh, that way we can continue to have that fellowship here at the end of our adult class. Uh, folks don't have to leave uh, to go up to pick their children up and teachers don't have to wait on them. So they're going to bring those children down. So keep that in mind so you can continue the fellowship, which is good. Uh, as Ben talked about sharing a meal together, I was, I was pleased to, to come this past Wednesday night and, and share a meal with you guys. We had a great turnout. Um, one, I, one thing I say at my house all the time, the kids, the kids probably get tired of me hearing it, is every time we have a meal, I tell them I'm going to eat like a king tonight. So uh, we ate like a king on Wednesday night. I appreciate those that prepared uh, the meal uh, for Cindy and Brenda and, and Leanne and anybody else that helped or is going to be helping throughout the, uh, these upcoming Wednesday night meals. So if you're not signed up, please sign up. It's a great opportunity uh, to just fellowship together, uh, to eat together, to fellowship together, to learn about each other, to become better together uh, before our devotionals on those nights. So I encourage you to sign up, and they'll be taking those sign-ups here after, after the end of uh, after the end of our 
our service this morning. Okay, last thing. Uh, Matt asked me to, to announce that everyone is going to stay in here when we close. The children are not going to be dismissed to their classes. So children are going to stay in here, and they will be dismissed uh, sometime during our adult class. Uh, there's some activities going on, and then they'll be dismissed later. So we, I'm going to pray, and once we get done with that, we're going to break, uh, and then we'll start class in a few minutes. But everyone will stay in the auditorium, at least for a short period. So let's bow as we close. Lord, how great it is to be here today, uh, Lord, to, to, to be in your presence, uh, to be with fellow Christians who have a, a, a similar mindset. For those that want to grow in you through, through study of Scripture, through fellowship with one another, through a desire to serve our community, to, uh, to bring, uh, just to live out the example that, that, that you showed here on this earth. Lord, we're so thankful this morning for, for those who prepared uh, and took the time to prepare for our worship service. Uh, let us never forget those folks that do, that, do, that, that feel pre preparation of our, our song service and Martin's preparation of our lesson and everyone else who participates. Lord, let us lift each other up as we go, um, as we close here, uh, as, we, as we communicate and work with each other each and every day and each week. Let us lift each other up and, and always find opportunities uh, in our community to, uh, to be that shining light. Lord, we pray that you'll continue to bless the Riverwood congregation and just help us to uh, be that shining light here in this community. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.